I'm Natalia Sopea and I've been working in Colombia uh, for over 13 years uh, on issues related to the conflict and victims. Uh, and uh, as Kathy uh, mentioned, I will be sharing with you some insights of um, our experience in working with victims and how to measure um, changes and transformations in communities. Good morning. Um, I'm Colleen Duncan. I also work in the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights um, in Colombia with, with Natalia. Um, I've been in Colombia since January, um, so in some ways I'm a, a relative newly returning um, international civil servant, if you will. Um, but I did live there um, at the beginning of 2000, so between 1999 and 2001, and at that time I was also with the High Commissioner's office. So it's actually quite interesting to be back there um, uh, now and sort of seeing what's going on. Um, before I was in Colombia, I, I had a fairly, uh, I had about a 10 year career also in the UN, but more with the UN's development program. Um, and I've always worked on peace and conflict issues. So um, during that time, I worked primarily in El Salvador and Guatemala on both of those peace processes. Um, and what really brings me here today and kind of the whole interest in measurement and evaluation is um, before rejoining the UN, I was about 15 years with the International Development Research Center working in their evaluation unit. And a big part of what we did there was actually trying to innovate new methods for measurement and evaluation. And so uh, some of my thinking will, will come out of that experience as well. But one of the things I think that's really always fascinated me in my career is just this whole idea of trying to work on what I would call hard to measure areas. And so I think that uh, some of the insights that we're going to share actually come from some of the thought that has gone into how do you measure really hard things because peace building is actually a really hard and intangible area to measure but there's also lots of other areas that are really hard to measure like how do you measure the non-transmission of the HIV virus or etc so there's lots of sectors that work on really hard to measure problems and so one of the things or one of the key messages that I really hope people are going to bring home is and I think it's really important is sometimes you, it's really important to look outside of your discipline. And that's one of the great things about inter interdisciplinarity is sometimes it's just great to sort of step outside and look at people who are working on similar issues or really tough issues and, you know, how are they doing it? So I would like to sort of try and um, encourage people to think in that direction. And I think Roger's uh, presentation is, is really fantastic in that sense. Mm -hmm. and I, I really very much see this presentation as a bit of a conversation starter. And I think a lot of these issues have already been sort of touched on um, tangentially um, in the first two days. Um, so I think there's a lot of really important um, things that we need to think about when we're trying to uh, think about measuring and evaluation transformation as part of political settlements. And I think one of the really important questions is, you know, we really need to think about what are we measuring? You know, what is it, what exactly is the type of change that we're thinking that we're trying to bring about with things like political sentiments? Are we measuring attitudinal change? Are we measuring normative change? Are we measuring behavior change by certain people, as uh, Roger flagged this morning? Um, these are important questions because, you know, what we measure actually, what we think we're measuring actually influences what our, what our choices are going to be around, what kind of methods we're going to use. Another important question I've heard about, who decides? You know, who actually decides what is, is important to measure? Who decides what transformation looks like? And the importance of bringing in multiple voices. Um, sometimes from the very local level up to the national level. That's an important consideration. And obviously, how do we measure? The whole question of what methods do we use, and most importantly, what do we count as evidence? I mean, evidence really brings in an important valuing dimension. Uh, are there some forms of data that are more valuable than other forms of data? Do we need different types of data? All, all of these things matter because Policymakers or people who make decisions around political settlements have to often make decisions on the basis of evidence. So what we what counts as evidence and what we consider to be important as data um, is really important. Um, another thing I've mentioned is I think it's really important when you're thinking about measuring progress in political settlements. It's really important to start from what we know. So as I mentioned, uh, I consider political settlements to be sort of a hard to measure area. And there are lots of other disciplines and areas of practice and international development, 
in health sciences, um, in climate change. I mean, measuring climate change, measuring the impacts of climate change. These are really tough things. So it's really important to go beyond your default setting. Um, another important consideration, when we're talking about transformation, we're often talking about really complex, deep social change. And those are hard things to get at. Um, so I think it's really important when we're thinking about this is, again, we need to look beyond our immediate project of political settlements and think about um, what can we bring in from other theory, uh, areas of uh, and streams of practice. Um, and just another um, important distinction that I think it's really important to make as we frame our discussion about measurement is um, most of the people here are researchers, but lots of people have also worked in international aid. They've worked on projects and programs. And I think when we're talking about measuring or understanding progress, there's actually kind of two ways that we can go about that. We can go about asking evaluative questions and trying to get answers through research. But also there's a whole field of theory and practice which is called program evaluation. And there's actually literature on that. There's lessons around that. And they share a lot of similarities. I mean, program evaluation, when we're trying to sort of track impacts and outputs and outcomes, they actually use social science methods. So it's really research by a different name, but there's some really important constraints around program evaluation. Program evaluation, for example, it's usually done in a much shorter, more concise time. And there's usually a client in program evaluation, someone who wants to know something, who wants to make decisions on the basis of the data that you're bringing. So I often say that program evaluation is kind of like research on steroids because it's really, you have to lift a lot more in a shorter period of time and there's always a client that you're performing for. So it's really important to understand that because program evaluation actually has a lot of constraints and limitations. And so I think it's important to think about also how can we use research to backstop program evaluation? And if I had my way in international aid, every international aid, aid project would have a research component, which could actually ask the deep evaluative questions that program evaluation often can't get to. So I'm going to pass the floor now to Natalia, who's going to um, uh, carry on in our presentation, going into a little bit about some context around Colombia and talking specifically about a case study, which we think is a really useful and a really interesting example of what transformation might actually look like in the context of political settlements. Uh, okay, so um, I know most of you are quite familiar with the Colombian context, so I'm not going to you know, uh, spend much time on a background presentation, but I do want to share this information with you in, um, to um, kind of give you a sense of the complexity of political settlements in Colombia because we're speaking uh, about um, many settlements over many years and involving many actors uh, and sometimes with unconsolidated um, results so political settlements are also um, viewed from the viewed from the national perspective but also from the subnational perspective and it's a very important component in the context of Colombia because um, regions are very different and they also have very specific dynamics uh, that we need to bear in mind. Well, uh, most of you know that we've been struggling for with a uh, 50-year uh, conflict and throughout that conflict uh, many political settlements have been um, uh, reached involving um, uh, the demobilization of various armed groups including the N19 ETL, um, uh, Quintin Lame and PRT. This was in the 80s and early 90s and um, what is very interesting uh, about Colombia is the 1991 constitution which was a very important political settlement for the nation and uh, despite the fact that the 91 constitution um, established a new, uh, a new consensus in the country um, there was escalation of, of conflict with other armed groups, which, which is particularly the FARC and the ELN. So it is a contradiction, but it's also showing the complexity of the Colombian context. In the 90s, then, we had the exacerbation of war linked to drug trafficking, and um, some marginal negotiations took place, but then a new process started with the FARC, 
And also we have a parallel uh, process uh, regarding uh, victims and the importance that victims took in terms of uh, from the governmental and policy making perspective of placing victims at the heart of policy making in Colombia. And that, is, uh, that came through the adoption of the law 387 on internal displacement to basically ensure an adequate response to um, internal displacement in Colombia. Then, uh, early 2000, 2003, um, there was the demilitarization zone in which uh, the FARC concentrated in certain areas, but then the peace process declined and the end of peace talks uh, with the FARC um, occurred and then there was a decreased appetite for peace process and this is very important because this is marking a lot of the current context in Colombia and nowadays. Um, 2003 to 2010, uh, these uh, loss of appetite for this process brain brought um, the adoption of the democratic security policy, which was trying to regain control of uh, previously controlled FARC areas. And, um, and also, uh, a peace agreement was reached with the uh, uh, right paramilitary groups, the AUC. And on that framework, a transitional justice mechanism was adopted, the Justice and Peace Law. Um, and um, which is also a continuation of this uh, process that I mentioned earlier in terms of placing victims at the heart of uh, decision making in, in Colombia. Um, then we have the adoption of the Victims Law in 2012, which is um, basically ensuring um, reparation to victims in this context and ensuring that victims, um, that the transitional justice mechanisms that have been going on are consolidated and that victims actually uh, have the opportunity to um, transform their lives, so uh, with a transformational approach. Uh, and then we have the continuation of the restart of the peace process with the FARC. Um, and the, up to now there have been agreements in four of six of the items of the negotiation agenda in terms of uh, rural development, political participation, illicit drugs, and victims. I think it, it has been said that tomorrow we're expecting the signature of the ceasefire, so we'll see, but this is moving quite fast and, and we can see that through these agreements very important um, issues and the root causes of the conflict are being addressed. So this is I wanted to share this slide with you because, as I said earlier, this shows the complexity of different layers of political uh, settlements in, in Colombia. But it also shows that previous um, settlements were partial and consolidated, involved uh, only certain parts of the conflict. And actually, this agreement also includes, at this stage, the FARC only. We'll see what happens with the other arm with the ELN. But this is the complexity in which we are trying to measure transformation and see what is actually changing for victims in, in Colombia. Uh, as Colleen mentioned, I wanted to share with you a case study of uh, the community of El Salado uh, in the northern part of Colombia, in the Caribbean. In the context of the victims' law, um, the law foresees the uh, implementation of what they call the collective reparation plans, which are um, a program aimed at um, identifying together with communities what they believe were the main damages caused by the conflict and then and then um, supporting them in the in determining which are um, the steps they believe as a community they need to take in order to um, retake their community like their coll their collective rights um, so um, the El Salado experience is interesting in terms of uh, this process of how they came about identifying uh, what were their damages and also uh, through a participatory assessment undertaking with, by IOM with uh, USAID funding they determined which were going to be those steps of their the collective reparations and you can see here um, what were the human rights violations that happened um, people got killed, right to life, right to personal integrity, right to liberty right to human dignity, economic, <coughs> social, and cultural rights were affected. Um, collective rights, their cultural rights were affected as well. And in terms of damages, you could see that these are um, disaggregated by economic, psychosocial, political, and cultural community. This is a very important component for the collective reparation plan. 
um, economic um, damages, rupture of productive cycles, loss of means to satisfy basic needs, changes in the use of land, um, loss of income and food security, limitation of uh, access to housing and wash, uh, water and sanitation services. Psychosocial, well, uh, I didn't want to traumatize you sharing all the experiences of the massacre, but um, there was uh, torture, there was rape going on, and um, the, dif the different psychosocial effects affect people in different ways depending on how they were during the massacre. Political impact on community organization, this is very important. And also um, the impact on their political influence capacity. And in terms of cultural and community, uh, the weakening of community organization, access to education, and community disintegration to, due to forced dis displacement. Um, the community, as you saw in the video, displaced for two years and then they returned. Um, and they struggle to uh, kind of um, uh, recompose what was the community before. So there's a lot of us prioritized as one of the, the of the pilot pro collective reparation projects in Colombia since 2008. Uh, you saw that the massacre took place in 2000 and then they returned in 2002. Um, so time. Uh, has passed by and under the Justice and Peace Law Framework, uh, uh, they started working in this participatory process to uh, identify what would be the reparation process and then was retaken by the Victims Law. Uh, so it, did, it has been an ongoing process as you can see. And in a way we consider that the victims uh, policy making process has been a political settlement in terms of engaging victims um, with the government in deciding what is going to be um, the policy making process uh, to, uh, for the reparation of their, their, their circumstances. Um, so, after the implementation of this um, reparations program, we can see that there have been uh, some changes in the community of Asalao despite, despite the, the, the horrible things that happened there. Um, this is a um, one of the houses of the El Salado that was painted by the community. And, and, and you can say they say, we are rebuilding our dreams. So um, this means that the community has regained the sense of community, of community life, and that they are working towards that. After having been displaced in different places of Colombia, they're now together again in the same place where they um, were victims of the massacre. The next one, please. Um, what are the, some, we could say, like the indicators from the uh, work with the community in which you can say that there have been transformations, important transformations for them. We can see that there are changes in attitudes and behaviors um, from um, testimonies of, of victims and focus groups that have been taking place in that community. Um, these are some examples. We feel capable of making our own decisions again, of discerning what is or isn't convenient for our community, and we are closer now. There has also been a reestablishment of community organizations, active participation of community leaders, including women, which were <coughs> main victims because um, the massacre, 60 people um, were killed, and 56 of them were men, the rest were women, so mainly a lot of widows and a lot of women experienced the massacre and were also victims of sexual violence, of course. Um, what's interesting about sexual violence in that massacre also is that uh, at the beginning only two cases of sexual uh, of rape were reported, but after the work that has been done by different institutions, by the Victims Unit and by different international organizations, Women started talking about, um, I don't know if you say this is the correct word in English, empowerment, empowerment of pregnant women. Um, and this only came after, and there seems to be like uh, guilt from the community to recognize that this happened in their community and share and accepting that this happened is a major thing for them. So this is why there has, re has been um, remained um, unknown uh, until recent years and this has been a work that has been going on involving women and letting them uh, decide when to participate and there has been a very interesting initiative called the uh, 
Now is not the time to remain silent. That is a national level initiative engaging uh, victims of sexual violence from the subnational level um, in uh, in uh, participating in different processes regarding their reparation as victims of sexual violence. <coughs> So this was just, uh, it's kind of complicated in five minutes to share the uh, experience of El Salado. But these are uh, interesting indicators in knowing how a community is changing. It's not only that, that, that they have been um, uh, helped by different international organizations, that they have received uh, a community hall, that they have received uh, 100 new houses, but on the attitudes and behaviors that uh, mark the community way of living. Thanks, um, Natalia. So I think uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk about uh, uh, collective reparation programs is because um, I think it's very uh, collective reparations and as a as a kind of a policy measure is a really interesting example of how um, you can actually try and bring transformation or build transformation into political settlements. And I think one of the really interesting things about coll collective reparations in Colombia is I think it's a it's a clear-cut example where the academic and the scholarly community have had a real influence on trying to shape what that particular public policy like. When you look at Columbia's collective reparation program, and you can argue about you know how well it's done, and you know are people feeling repaired and are they feeling uh, healed, etc. But it's actually quite a sophisticated program, and I think one of the really interesting things about it, and the point that I, I was trying to make earlier, is, is that transformation really has a backward-looking component, mm -hmm. because when you're talking about transforming and changing something, but it also has a very future and forward-looking uh, dimension to it, too. And reparation, I think, and the way that collective reparations have been framed up in Colombia, um, really speaks to that. It really speaks to the corrective dimension of trying to um, uh, repair uh, harm suffered in the past, particular forms of harm, internal displacement, general insecurity, loss of this sense of community and, and specific cultural dimensions. Um, sexual violence is obviously an issue, one, a, a big one, but the idea around reparation and collective reparation as it has been, uh, they've been trying to apply it in Colombia and as um, and a huge contribution, I think, of the research community has been to try and build in also this transformative dimension. So you actually are trying to make this qualitative leap where you're not just trying to return a victim to the status quo ante, to the situation they were in before harm happened, but you're actually trying to shake up power structures. You're actually trying to um, basically intervene change hierarchies and bring people to a better place than where they've been before. And it's very it's very controversial, it's been very contested also among international lawyers. And I think actually the work of gender um, and women's groups and people who have been thinking on gender, including a lot of the people that are in this room, have been really influential in trying to bring in this whole tr idea of transformation in the idea of liberation. <coughs> So maybe just moving into the last part of our presentation is I thought it would be helpful to, um, it, as a bit of a conversation starter for us, um, to talk a little, some about some of the big tensions that I think come up uh, when we're trying to uh, measure and evaluate uh, transformation. And I think the first one is this whole issue that some people have been alluding to is this whole issue of tangible versus intangible outcomes. And I really like this graphic because this graphic is actually taken from some practitioners who work in democratic dialogue. So they work in dialogue processes, which are processes in which it's really hard to show progress and it's really hard to show results. And what I like about this is they actually put under the waterline, you can sort of see all of these so-called intangible outcomes. Things like changing mental models, changing feelings, changing perceptions. Um, these are actually the things that are under the water level and that are actually really hard to measure um, and really hard to get at. But interestingly, these so-called soft results of transformation, I think are the hardest results of all to achieve and they're the hardest ones to measure. And actually, you need the soft results in order to be able to get above the waterline to see some of those other more obvious results, like new relationships being uh, formed. Even behavior change is much easier to see than some of these other things around mental models. But these are actually some of the things which I would call almost like the human scaffolding 
of transformation. If you don't have those under the water areas of change, then really, um, it, then really it's quite difficult going forward. And I think that one of the important things um, that a few other people have alluded to is this whole issue of process, and that I think uh, Christine talked about on the first day. What it really means is it's a bit of a mind shift, I think, for us as researchers and we're thinking about measuring. What it really means is that means become as important as ends, and that's a really important thing to bear in mind. Quickly, the next tension I'd like to talk to, and lots of people have um, alluded to, and I mentioned on the first day, is one of the big problems that we have, I think especially in the area of international aid, when we're talking about project and program evaluation, is even though there have been some advancements around trying to apply systems approaches to measurement, generally um, international aid is very stuck in linear, linear models to monitoring and measuring and evaluation. And so, you know, those of you who have kind of worked um, in the field and who have worked with funders um, who are either working in development or peace building, you know, this is sort of a typical logical framework that you'll see, you know, where you basically put certain resources, you know, it's kind of like sausage factory, um, resources in, resources out. Um, you know, somehow there's this magical formula where you have inputs and activities and outputs and it's going to lead to very long-term lofty goals and impacts. And I think the interesting thing about this model and about logical frameworks is they're actually management tools. They're not actually meant to be measurement tools. They're actually planning tools, but people tend to use them and get stuck into very linear mind frames of thinking that social change is actually a very linear project. And I think that's one of the things that uh, is something that we need to try and move beyond is when we're working in deep social change initiatives like transformation is moving beyond these linear models. They also tend to really oversimplify causal relationships, which lots of people have been talking about uh, here. Um, another thing, um, time frames are unpredictable. Uh, and Natalia really mentioned, uh, she, she noted that when she sort of put up that timeline of the many layers of political settlements in, in Colombia. We're talking about deep transformative change, which takes years and years um, to, to actually be able to uh, bring about. Um, but one of the difficulties is when we're working within projects and programs and public policies that are meant to underpin political settlements, the reporting time frames are really stilted and really short. So you're, you're kind of reporting year one, year two, year three. I mean, and in the mind of the international community and some of the, the funders and the people who actually work in sort of underwriting political settlements, you're lucky if they stay there beyond five years. So, you know, how do we kind of move beyond these unpredictable time frames, I think is an issue. And as much as I actually really hate kind of that whole language around low hanging fruit and early wins because it's kind of schlocky but actually it, I think it's really important and when we're measuring political settlements because it's really important also for people to generate a sense of confidence so people actually do need to see some progress along these timelines so I wouldn't completely throw out the idea of kind of looking for early wins or early outcomes, incremental outcomes along the pathway to impact. These are important things that we also have to try and document and bring evidence to bear around. The other tension which I think a lot of people have also um, alluded to is the whole issue of um, attribution. Um, generally um, when we're working within political settlements, um, and this is probably really tied to the funding question, but it's kind of this whole idea around projectization and the pressure that people feel to show um, you know, a very simple relationship, a, a very simple causal relationship that my project led to a certain result. It's never like that. I mean, political settlements are a huge, messy, complex system, as Roger's beautiful Paula um, painting, I think, pointed out. And basically, anything that we do in international aid through projects or programs really just sit within that system. I mean, we're, we're travelers. We're there for a very short time. So the whole attribution dilemma, I think, is, is a tricky one. Um, and as I think Natalia's timeline really nicely set out is when we're thinking about any kind of transformative change that's being brought about, in a place like Colombia, the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, 
which political settlement am I trying to actually attribute to that to? And which policy, which was funded um, under the auspices of that political settlement, am I actually also trying to attribute that change to? And then if I bring it down to an even lower level, which project, which was funded within that public policy agenda, was I, was I also trying to attribute it to? A few other complications um, that <coughs> arise um, in the issue of Columbia um, is the whole issue thinking about things like re-victimization. I mean, my husband's family, my husband is Colombian, and his family alone was displaced three times um, in Colombia in the course of what you might call three different conflicts. But I mean, to victims, those kind of things don't really matter. Um, so these kind of things, they're multi or trans transgenerational, these types of harm. And so the type of transformation also has to address that. And then the whole thing around, people talk a lot about in Colombia, is the issue of mental models is actually trying to bring people to a different place where they can actually imagine transformation. Um, you know, again, my husband um, says to me, you know, I've never lived in peace in Colombia. So it's even difficult for people, for, there are multiple generations who have never lived in peace. And so to even imagine that peace is possible is difficult. So that whole issue of trying to change mental models, I think is a really important one. So in a nutshell, um, I think what people have really been talking about um, over the last couple of days is that you know, measuring transformative social change under political settlements is actually it's a pretty untidy business. Um, it's fit within a larger system. Often, we're trying to measure things that didn't happen, like a, a resurgence of violence, uh, local level conflict prevention, things like non-discrimination, uh, empathy, um, generating levels of trust. Um, some of these things happen, some of them don't happen. So sometimes actually trying to trying to measure what doesn't happen is as important as. Um, and I think a, a, probably another uh, important piece to, to bring about, and that actually kind of brings me on to the, the next uh, uh, last set of uh, observations that I'd like to make is working um, generally um, in the context in which political settlements are taking place, they're they're largely they're very unpredictable. They're very dynamic. They're very subject to change. Um, they're often very volatile, and that makes measurement in these areas really difficult. Because generally, in measurement, you know, we like to sort of hold a constant and measure forward from a baseline, and it's not always very easy to do that in some of these uh, contexts. So maybe just on to the last piece. Um, and this is just to kind of more sort of whet your appetite or renew you, uh, introduce you to some of the thinking that's coming about in the evaluation community now. Is there's been over the last seven or eight years a lot of talk around how complexity science can be used for measurement. Um, and one of the great things about uh, complexity science is it actually recognizes a lot of these constraints um, that I've just um, flagged around trying to measure transformation. And for those of you who are really interested in it, um, you should uh, maybe look at uh, the book Aid at the Edge of Chaos, which was uh, written by uh, Ben Ramelingen, who uh, actually was with Overseas Development Institute for many years, but he's done a lot, a lot of work on complexity thinking and bringing complexity thinking into issues of measurement and evaluation, and coincidentally also worked with the organization that I was with for many years, um, coordinating um, our outcome mapping learning community. So how can complexity thinking help? Um, this is kind of a very uh, simple, uh, what I would call kind of a heuristic that's been put together by um, some two complexity theorists, uh, Gluberman and Zimmerman. And it's kind of a complexity theory for dummies, or kind of a way to parse out or demonstrate how human problems can be deconstructed. And again, you know, I would stress, I, wouldn't, I, I don't even call it a framework, I call it a heuristic, because I think it's a useful tool to apply to sort of think about how you can wrestle with this problem. But taking a closer look at complexity theory, what complexity theorists did is they basically parsed out um, human problems or social change into three categories. And the first is the whole idea around uh, simple problems, complicated problems, and complex problems. Is it, has anybody here sort of, are they familiar with this or have they looked at this? 
Okay, so this is really hot in the geeky evaluation community. People talk about this a lot, but I think it's actually really, really useful for researchers. And what it talks about is when you're actually tackling problems or when you're actually <coughs> tackling problems and you're trying to move people towards transformation, sometimes it's easy to parse them out into these simple, complicated, and complex categories. So simple problems are basically problems of the they have descriptors of the type that you see here. So generally, there's a right recipe. You have to have the right recipe. It's essential. You get the same result every time that you apply it. So think about a project design, for example. Um, the relationship between cause and effect is really obvious. It's easy to measure. And this is, when you're talking about simple projects, that's often where the area where you can talk about best practice. And you can almost do the same thing every time, and it's almost going gonna, gonna to produce the same result result. Complicated problems are somewhat different. In that case, formulas are needed, but it also requires some specialized knowledge. You can build experience over time, um, and the project can likely be repeated with, with success, but you do have to incorporate some adaptations. So when you're talking about projects in the area of complicated, um, the cause and effect relationship is a little bit more tenuous, and that's where we're sort of talking more about good practice. You can generate good practice, but you always have to be thinking about this idea of tweaking and adapting. When we're talking about complex problems, um, there's no right recipes. There's no right recipes or protocols. There's a huge influence of outside factors. They, they influence heavily. Um, experience helps, but it doesn't guarantee success. And the relationship between cause and effect can only be perceived in retrospect. So we're really talking about emergence and emergent practice here. Um, so the, if you just click on in the last little graphics there is, when people are talking about simple, they're talking about following a recipe. Complicate is more like sending a rocket to the moon where you actually have a formula, but if you have a good technical formula, you might be able to get it done. Complex is like raising a child. It's different every single time, and you don't know what's going to come at you. So that's really about emergence. So just to finish up, um, I think that in some of the contexts in which we're trying to um, think about applying political settlements or bringing them forward, is this is actually uh, taken from complexity thinking, and this is the work of a guy named Dave Snowden, who's really worked on this, and this framework is called the the Sinefin framework, which is actually a Welsh word. Um, and basically what he's done is he's actually um, mapped these categories. And, and I've taken his categories and actually tried to drop in typical interventions or typical projects that you would kind of see happening as part of a political settlement process. So, good pro so simple, for example, is the whole issue of disarming combatants, not reintegrating, but actually disarming, decommissioning arms. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's been done over and over uh, uh, in, in, in multiple contexts around the world. We have a pretty good idea of best practice on how that's to be done. A uh, good practice, complicated, is probably around tracing missing persons, which is one aspect that's included in Colombia's victim agreement, for example, <coughs> uh, the Comisión de Búsqueda. You know, we're, it's, it's going to look different across contexts, but we have some good formulas which can be followed. Um, complex is an emergent practice for me would be the issue of reintegrating child combatants. So even when I think about the differences of experiences of child combatants in Uganda, of child combatants that you would have seen in El Salvador, for example, these are fundamentally different experiences due to the way that they joined up, the types of abuse that they um, that they suffered. So actually trying to bring them and potentially reintegrating them into society, which is actually really debated because some people say you can't even really do that, that societies never really fully bring child combatants back into the fold. But this is really kind of uncharted territory. We're really in emergent practice here. The other issue that I think that's just that's interesting on um, thank you. <laughs> The other um, interesting thing that's, that's on that axis um, that I think that Dave Snowden's contribution to complexity thinking was this whole idea of close to agreement, close to certainty, far from certainty, far from an agreement. And that really gives you a sense of when you're thinking about projects or initiatives that you're implementing, 
The agreement issue is around how much agreement actually exists about what the right strategies might be to get you to, um, to a result. And certainty is around how certain are you that applying the strategies will actually uh, lead to the desired result. So you can see as you go farther out into the stratosphere of simple, complicated, and complex, you actually get farther away from, from certainty around knowing what types of things you should do to bring about those types of transformation. So just to finish up, I tried to bring this to another level because I found this heuristic really useful for thinking about conflict contexts and contexts in which political uh, settlements are often happening. And I thought about some of the places that I had worked or some of the places that some of my um, direct colleagues have been working um, or, or studying in. And from my perspective, um, I lived in El Salvador from 92 to 95. I really felt like that political um, uh, settlement process was fairly simple. There, were, there was government, there was the FMLN, you know, there were two parties to the conflict. Um, there was a fairly simple recipe going forward. Um, you didn't have a lot of um, other external actors involved in the, in the conflict. You didn't have as heavy of a geopolitical dimension in it. It was pretty simple. Um, Guatemala, I think, was much more complicated. Um, I worked in Guatemala from 95 to 97. Uh, you had the issue of genocide, um, the role um, and the victimization of indigenous people within Guatemala. Uh, you had a very uh, much more complex socio-political economy, um, indices of poverty and underdevelopment, which I think had to be much more wrestled with in Guatemala. For me, much more of a complicated um, political settlement uh, type of environment. Um, I put Colombia in complex, mainly for the reasons that uh, Natalia has uh, outlined to you. Many actors, lots of emergence, lots of innovation going on. Not sure if it's going to work, um, but there are a lot of uh, new things being tried. Um, and there are a lot of factors that are going to affect um, success. I would have put Syria in complex in 2010. Nowadays, I would put Syria actually in chaos. I mean, I think it's going to be so difficult to bring about a political settlement um, in Syria. And I also almost would have put Rwanda in the immediate aftermath of, of the genocide into the area of complex, where people just actually had no idea what to do. So, I'll make that decision.